Hey y'all, so I am going to read to you a short story by Mr. Ray Bradbury called All Summer in a Day. If you would like to follow along, I have it here for you as well. And then after we're just going to do some work um, about kind of class culture and what you thought about this classroom, how they treated um, their peers, and um, yeah, kind of how we can make sure stuff like this doesn't happen in our classroom. Because we're all a family um, and we're going to be learning together. So we need to make sure that we are treating everybody with respect and kindness. So follow along as I read. I'm going to try to highlight kind of what I'm reading to keep me on track a little bit. Ready? Ready. Now? Soon. Do the scientists really know? Will it happen today? Will it? Look, look. See for yourself. The children press to each other like so many roses, so many weeds, intermixed, peering out for a look at the hidden sun. It rained. It had been raining for seven years. Thousands upon thousands of days compounded and filled from one end to the other with rain, with the drum and gush of water, with the sweet crystal fall of showers, and the concussion of storms so heavy, they were tidal waves come over the islands. A thousand forests had been crushed under the rain and grown up a thousand times to be crushed again. And this was the way of life was forever on the planet of Venus. And this was the schoolroom of the children of the rocket men and women who had come to a reigning world to set up civilization and live out their lives. It's stopping, it's stopping. Yes, yes. Margot stood apart from them, from these children who could ever even remember a time where there wasn't rain and rain. They were all nine years old. And if there had been a day seven years ago when the sun came out for an hour and showed its face to the stunned world, they could not recall. Sometimes at night she heard them stir in remembrance and she knew they were dreaming and remembering gold or a yellow crayon or a coin large enough to buy the world with. She knew they thought they remembered a warmness, like a blushing in the face, in the body, in the arms, in the legs, and trembling hands. But then they always awoke to the tatting drum, the endless shaking down of clear bead necklace upon the roof. The walk, the gardens, the forest, and their dreams were gone. All day yesterday, they had read in class about the sun, about how like a lemon it was and how hot and they had written small stories or essays or poems about it. I think the sun is a flower that blooms just for one hour. That was Margot's poem, read in a quiet voice in the still classroom when the rain was still falling outside. Ah, oh, you didn't write that, protested one of the boys. I did, I, I did, said Margot. William, said the teacher, but that was yesterday. Now the rain was slackening and the children were crushed in the great thick windows. Where's the teacher? She'll be back. She better hurry. We'll miss it. They turned on themselves like a feverish wheel, all tumbling smoke spokes. Margot stood alone. She was a very frail, frail girl who looked as if she had been lost in the rain for years and the rain had washed out the blue from her eyes and the red from her mouth and the yellow from her hair. She was an old photograph dusted from an album, whited away, and if she spoke at all, her voice would be a ghost. Now she stood separate, staring at the rain and the loud, wet world beyond the huge glass. What are you looking at, said William. Margot said nothing. Speak when you're spoken to. He gave her a shove, but she didn't move. Rather, she let herself be moved only by him and nothing else. They edged away from her. They would not look at her. She felt them go away. And this was because she would play no games with them in the echoing tunnels of the underground city. If they tagged her and ran, she stood blinking after them and did not follow. When the class sang songs about happiness and life and games, her lips barely moved. Only when they sang about the sun and the summer did her lips move as she watched the drenched windows. And then, of course, the biggest crime of all was that she had come here only five years ago from Earth. And she remembered the sun and the way the sun was and the sky 
and when she was four in Ohio. And they had been on Venus their whole lives. And they had only been two years old when the sun last came out and had long forgotten the color and the heat of it and the way it really was. But Margot remembered. It's like a penny, she once said, eyes closed. No, it's not, the children cried. It's like a fire, she said, in the stove. You're lying. You don't remember, cried the children. But she remembered and stood quietly apart from all of them and watched the patterning windows. And once a month ago, when she refused to shower in the school shower rooms, she clutched her hands to her ears over her head, screaming, the water mustn't touch her head. Soon after that, dimly, dimly, she sensed it. She was different, and they knew her difference and kept away. There was a talk that her father and her mother were taking her back to Earth next year. It seemed so vital for her that they do so, though it would mean the loss of thousands of dollars to her family. And so the children hated her for all these reasons of big and little consequences. They hated her pale snow face, her waiting silence, her thinness, and her possible future. Get away, the boy gave her another shove. What are you waiting for? Then for the first time, she turned and looked at him, and what she was waiting for was in her eyes. Well, don't wait around here, cried the boy savagely. You won't see nothing. Her lips moved. Nothing, he cried. It was all a joke, wasn't it? He turned to the other children. Nothing's happening today, is it? They all blinked at him, and then understanding laughed and shook their heads. Nothing, nothing. Oh, but... Margot whispered, her eyes helpless. But this is the day. The scientists predict. They say they know the sun. All a joke, said the boy, and seized her roughly. And everybody, let's put her in the closet quick before the teacher comes. No, Margot said, falling back. They surged up around her and caught her up and bore her, protested and pleading, and then crying back into the tunnel, a room, a closet, where they slammed and locked the door. They stood looking at the door and saw it tremble from her beating and throwing herself against it. They heard the muffled cries, then smiling, they turned and went back down the tunnel just as the teacher arrived. Ready, children, she glanced at her watch. Yes, said everyone. Are we all here? Yes. The rain slacked a little more. The crowded, they crowded to the huge door. The rain stopped. It was as if in the midst of a film concerning an avalanche, a tornado, a hurricane, a volcanic eruption, something had gone wrong with the sound apparatus, thus muffling and finally cutting off all noise. All of the blasts and the repercussion and the thunders and then second, ripped from the film projector and inserted in its place beautiful tropical slide, which did not move or tremor. The world ground to a standstill. The silence was so immense and unbelievable that you felt like your ears had been stuffed or you lost your hearing altogether. The children put their hands to their ears. They stood apart. The door slid back and the smell of silent waiting world came to them. The sun came out. It was the color of a flaming bronze and it was very large. And the sky around it was a blazing blue tile color and the jungle burned with sunlight as the children, released from their spell, rushed out yelling into the springtime. Now don't go too far, called the teacher after them. You've only got two hours, you know. You wouldn't want to get caught out. But they were running and turning their faces up to the sky and feeling the sun on their cheeks like a warm iron. They were taking off their jackets and letting the sun burn their arms. Oh, it's better than sun lamps, isn't it? Much, much better. They stopped running and stood in the great jungle that covered Venus, that grew and never stopped growing tumultuously, even as they watched it. It was a nest of octopi, clustering a great arms of flesh-like weeds, wavering, flowering in the brief spring. It was the color of rubber and ash, this jungle from so many years without sun. It was the color of stone and white cheeses and ink, and it was the color of the moon. The children lay out laughing on the jungle mattress, and heard it sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. They ran among the trees, they slipped and fell, they pushed each other, they played hide and seek and tag, but most of all, they squinted at the sun until their tears ran down their faces. They put their hands up to that yellowness and the amazing blueness they breathed of the fresh air, 
fresh air and listened and listened to the silence which suspended them in a blessed sea of no sound and motion. They looked at everything and savored everything. Then wildly like animals escaped from their cave, they ran and ran and shouted in circles. They ran for an hour and did not stop running. And then in the midst of their running, one of the girls wailed. Everyone stopped. The girl standing in the open held out her hand. Oh, look, look, she said, trembling. They came slowly to look at her open palm. In the center of it cupped was a huge single raindrop. She began to cry looking at it. They glanced quietly at the sun. Oh, oh, a few cold drops fell on their noses and their cheeks and their mouths. The sun faded behind the stir of a mist. The wind blew cold around them. They turned and started to walk back toward the underground house their hands at their sides, their smiles vanishing away. A boom of thunder startled them. And like leaves before a hurricane, they tumbled upon each other and ran. Lightning struck 10 miles away, five miles away, a mile, a half a mile. The sky darkened into a midnight, into in a flash. They stood in the doorway of the underground for a moment until it was raining hard. Then they closed the door and heard the gigantic sound of rain falling in tons and avalanches everywhere and forever. Will it be seven more years? Yes, seven. Then one of them gave a little cry. Margo! What? She's still in the closet where we locked her there. Margo? They stood as if someone had driven them like so many stakes into the floor. They looked at each other and then looked away. They glanced at the world that was raining and now raining and raining steadily. They could not meet each other's glances. Their faces were solemn and pale. They looked at their hands and feet, their faces down. Margot. One of the girls said, well, no one moved. Go on, whispered the girl. Then they walked slowly down the hall, the sound of cold rain. They turned through the doorway to the room and the sound of storm and thunder, lightning on their faces, blue and terrible. They walked over to the closet door slowly and stood by it. Behind the closet door was only silence. They unlocked the door even more slowly and let Margot out. <laughs>